Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you because we're getting ready and we're preparing for the harvesting of souls. We praise your name because the same privilege is given to us today to lift Jesus up, to exalt him, to tell of what he did on the cross of Calvary so that when he's lifted up, his sacrifice, his death, his burial, his resurrection, then he by his spirit will draw all men unto himself. As we're looking forward to the coming days, when Jesus will be lifted up, when the word will be preached, when thousands will hear that word, Father, we are praying that by the Holy Ghost, you'll draw thousands to yourself in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that as it happened on the day of Pentecost, that many that heard the word, gladly received the word, they repented, they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, they were added to the family of God. We're praying that in the coming days, as preachers, from this place, exalt Jesus Christ. As they lift up Jesus Christ, as they speak the truth, Father, we are praying many will be born again and come into the kingdom in Jesus' name. Prepare every one of us. The singers, the preachers, the counselors, the Bible study leaders, all the various workers at the coming retreat, prepare every one of us in Jesus' name. And let it happen as it happened in days gone by. That souls will be saved. The sick will be healed. And many will get into the blessing that is already purchased from Calvary. We know it is so. In Jesus' name we pray. In our study of Acts of the Apostles, we have now come to the climax of the event that happened on the day of Pentecost. It's wonderful to see the 120 believers saved and sanctified, united together, obedient to the Lord, being in a room hearing sound from heaven. It's very exciting to see them as the tongues of fire came upon each of them. And it is marvelous to see them receiving the Holy Ghost, being filled with the Holy Ghost, or baptized in the Holy Ghost, and then speaking in new languages not learned before. It's very glorious as you see these 120 disciples speaking for the wonderful works of God. And yet it's a marvel to get all the crowd and the thousands gathered together because they wondered what really had happened. They marveled, they were surprised or astonished, but were told some of them mocked, and that makes us to quiver and tremble because this was a great moment in the history of God's dealings with man that this mighty wind, uh, the sound of a rushing mighty wind came, the uh, appearance of the fire came, and then the glory of God so shone upon them they started speaking in new languages. And these were mocking. But then, how beautiful to see the Apostle Peter now having received the Holy Ghost and the power is upon him. How marvelous to see him rising up and giving out a message, a sermon. And this happens to be the historic sermon, the first ever preached by human being in Pentecostal power. The Holy Ghost has now come. The promised power was within the disciples and the apostles, and one of them rose up to demonstrate that power. He explained Pentecost. He exalted the Prince, Jesus Christ, and he exalted the people. Now we want to examine the effect of the message on them. It's nice to preach, but what's the effect? It's nice to work for God, but what's the result? It's beautiful to use your voice and to use your energy to proclaim the glad tidings and the gospel, the good news of the kingdom, but what's the result? One will see them, the hearers, 
as they were convicted, as they were preached, because the Apostle Peter had preached in the power of the Holy Ghost. And you turn with me to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 37. Now, when they, had, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this unto a generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Today, we want to see how the message ended. You know, I told you before that in a message, you have the introduction. You have the body of the message, which is a theme. You have the conclusion of the message, then you have the appeal at the end of the message, if it, if it is an evangelistic message. You see, the gospel preaching is a type of preaching that demands decision. And as we're getting involved in the coming program that we're having in 22 locations in Lagos State, I'm assuming and expecting that you want to get Bible result. Well, you won't get Bible result if you don't preach the Bible message. You cannot get Bible result if you don't preach with well, the Bible message. The Bible result will come when the Bible message is there. The Bible method is there. And if you are going to preach in the Bible way, there ought to be an introduction, a challenging introduction, an exciting introduction, an arresting introduction, so that nobody will sleep while you are preaching. You can tell on the day of Pentecost, or the crowd that came together, or the power of the Holy Ghost upon Peter, nobody slept. It was a day you couldn't sleep in the, uh, during the meeting. It was a message you just couldn't uh, afford not to pay attention to. Because Peter arrested that congregation when he gave his introduction and referred to the Bible in Joel's prophecy. And if you are going to preach the Bible way, there must be an arresting, interesting, capturing introduction. Then the body of the message, the theme of your message, must be scriptural, Peter's words. It must be Christ-oriented, exalting Christ. Peter's message exalted Christ. It must be logical. It must present the Bible way of salvation in a simple, clear manner to the people. And they see did. He confronted them with the sin they had committed. They had crucified Christ. But then he confronted them with a challenge that mercy was available. Of course, if they did not repent, they will be judged. And then he brought a conclusion in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made the same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. But then, as a preach at the retreat time, and you are preaching to exalt Christ, to exalt the people, and to explain the scriptures to the people. You are not just interested in giving a challenging introduction, a logical, presentable, a scriptural body or theme of the message, and just a climactic a conclusion to the people. You are going to make what the Bible calls an appeal. And in evangelistic message, this is so important. We call it 
giving the altar call. We call it giving an invitation. We call it making an appeal to the people. Or we call it just challenging them to decision. And this is what ended the message. Because Peter wanted the people to know that the gospel presentation demands decision. It is a call that men repent and return to God and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So, if it is challenging them to a decision, then they must decide after you have presented the gospel. In fact, Joel's prophecy, you remember that uh, Peter had been referring to the prophecy of Joel. And Joel's prophecy in chapter 3, verse 14 tells us let me read from verse 13 put ye in the sequel for the harvest is ripe come get you down for the press is full the fats overflow for their wickedness is great and you put this into the setting of the day of Pentecost I told you before the feast of the weeks the feast of Pentecost was a feast separated or dedicated to the harvesting of their crops. But Pentecost, in the spiritual sense, was just the beginning of the harvesting of souls. And even though Joel was talking about a latter day judgment, telling the people the time is coming, when the sick will be put in, there will be a harvesting, but a harvest of judgment. But on the day of Pentecost, it wasn't a harvest of judgment. It was a harvest of souls. And he said, if the preacher is going to end the message, there must be this appeal so that an harvest will be possible. Look at verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And so you can see, on the day of Pentecost, there were multitudes and they were brought to the valley of decision. They were confronted with the truth. They had crucified Jesus Christ, but God has raised him up. They put him to death, but, but God gave him life. They rejected the Messiah, but the Lord approved him by signs and wonders and miracles. And now these are witnesses telling them, you are in the valley of decision, Christ is Lord. Jesus is Christ, is the Messiah, is the Savior. And the house of Israel must know assuredly that this is he, the same Jesus, no other one. No doubt, all these hearers were in the valley of decision. And so, when the preacher is preaching an evangelistic message, as an evangelist or a soul winner, he must challenge the hearers to decide at the end of the message. I'm telling you this because very soon, at the end of this week, on Friday night, we're starting. And even though it's the beginning of the retreat, that day, it's evangelistic. It's challenging the people lifting up Jesus Christ. Already the members of the choir have told us, they said, lift up Christ, lift him up, lift him up for the world to see. Let them know that he is Savior. Let them know he died for their sins. And as we lift him up, according to his promise, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. And from Friday night, all through Saturday and Sunday and Monday, until the end, Tuesday of the retreat, you are lifting Jesus up. And then, when you end each message, each message, you are challenging them to a decision, to accept, to receive the pardon, the peace, the freedom, the eternal life that Christ has provided for them. Well, you see, my brother, my sister, giving a challenge to decision at the end of a message is not new. Giving the altar call at an evangelistic message is not new. If you turn to Exodus chapter 20, chapter 32, verse 26, you see, Moses met the people in sin. They had backsliding, all of them. And I was telling them, you have offended God. But now after telling them they had offended God, 
after praying for them and interceding for them, after telling them it was possible they would still be received by the Lord because God is not going to destroy them if they will only repent, he must give a challenge. And in Exodus 32 verse 26, Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. I know that's what the preachers will be doing. There will be a space created between the preacher and the congregation at the time of the retreat. And that space is to make the sinners, the hearers, come forward after the message. And one way or the other, the preacher, the soul winner, the evangelist, whoever he is at the retreat, will be saying this. He'll be saying, you have heard the word of God and what I preach to you. I've read the scriptures to you. And I've shown you that there is mercy, there is pardon, there is forgiveness. Now you want to be on the Lord's side. You want to break away from the world. You want to break away from Satan who is on the Lord's side. Let him come unto me. And he'll be telling them as, you know, maybe the choir will be singing, Just as I am, without one plea, I come, I come. And these people who have been touched, whose stars have been stirred up, they'll be coming forward one by one. That's the altar call. That's the appeal. So that they can surrender their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're told in verse 26, And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. They responded to the altar call. You remember? In Joshua chapter 24. Now, Joshua had also challenged the people. He had told them the truth. Now, at the end of the message, you must give what I'm calling the altar call, the appeal, or the challenge to decide. And in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You see, that's another way of giving the altar call. You see, different preachers, Depending on the message they have just preached. Depending on the emphasis they have put in the theme of the message. Different preachers may use different methods in, uh, you know, pronouncing or proclaiming the altar call. Telling the people to come forward or to raise their hands. And then to begin to confess their sins unto the Lord. Joshua in his own case said, choose you this day. Choose you this day. There is a difference between life and death, you know. Choose one. A difference between darkness and light, choose one. A difference between confusion and peace, choose one. A difference between Christ and Satan, choose on which side you will be. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve all the gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went among all the people through whom we passed. And he decided they will follow the Lord in First Kings chapter 18, verse 21. Here Elijah, at the end of three and a half years of famine, was challenging the people. Again, he was calling them to a decision, making the altar call. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long? Hold ye between two opinions. You know, when you preach, you must not leave the people confused. At the end of your message, you must not leave them halting, vacillating between two opinions, whether to believe or not to believe. It must be very clear at the end of your message, you are calling them to Christ. It must be very clear you are presenting to them the grace of God. It must be very clear the way of salvation. It must be very clear that it is possible for them to have eternal life on this side of heaven. And after that message, Elijah, you like Elijah will say, How long hold ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. But then 
He knew that if they answered not a word, they had not decided. And therefore, he must, you know, find how they will decide. And he put the test of decision there. That he will make the sacrifice, but there will be no fire therein. And the prophets of Baal will, you know, pray to their gods, to the idols. And if the idols bring fire, we're going to serve the idols. But if the idols cannot bring fire, and I pray, and the fire comes upon my sacrifice from heaven by God, then we're going to serve the Lord God. And the people said, yes, that's what we're going to do. Look at verse 39. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. That's calling people to decision. Moses did it. Joshua did it. Jo and Elijah did it. You know, Jesus Christ, He also called people to decision in His own ministry. In fact, He made people to be able to make a public act of their faith and decision. Anytime he preached, he always looked for a positive effect and result. You remember in Matthew chapter 4, when he met the sons of Zebedee and Peter and Andrew, he also challenged them at the end of, you know, his encounter with them and their encounter with him. He gave them the chance to be able to decide. And you know, an evangelistic message is not completed until you give the people an opportunity to be able to decide. And if you are not used to that, you know, you must practice and plan for it before the retreat time. Because that's what we're all going to do in every retreat location, giving the sinners the chance to decide for Christ. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, and he said unto them, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. That's calling them to a decision. I'm reminding you of the case of Zacchaeus. In Luke chapter 19. You know, I've told you that during the retreat, at the end of the message, you, it's part of the message, not just something you add onto it, because, you know, it's the climax of your message. The altar call, making the appeal, calling the people, challenging the people to decide for Christ and to come forward. You know, as I've told you that they should come forward, maybe you're asking, what is the biblical um, foundation or basis or example for the people to come forward like that? You know, the case of Zacchaeus is an example. Because in Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, in verse 5, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must abide at thy house. He wanted Jesus. He had heard much about Jesus and he wanted to see Jesus Christ. And Jesus came to this climactic point, event in the life of, Z of Zacchaeus. And Jesus could have passed by, but he didn't. He called him and challenged him to a decision. He told him to jump down. Make haste and come down. And you know, you are telling the people at the end of your message to make haste. They mustn't delay because tomorrow may be too late. Today is a day of salvation. Make haste and come down because today Jesus Christ is knocking at the door of your heart and he wants to make your heart his home. And Zacchaeus responded and he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. You know, as the people are coming, some of them because of conviction may be weeping. Some of them, because of the opportunity and privilege of receiving forgiveness, may be very happy. Some of them, who are not emotional, may not manifest any external, outward, uh, outward act of emotion. They may just be coming uh, quietly and coming with deep thought in their heart, with real decision and determination they are going to follow the Lord. However they come, emotionally or not emotionally, the point is, they must come. And as they come forward, they confess their sins to God. They turn away from their sins. They believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they will be saved. That's the work that God has given us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. 
Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, we plead with you. In Christ said, be ye reconciled to God. That's what the preacher does at the end of the evangelistic message. We plead with you. We beg you. We beseech you. Be reconciled with God. Settle the account with him. Don't continue in enmity. Now you come back to Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Now Peter had presented the message. And now he's going to give the people the chance to decide. Now the point is, what's the purpose of giving this altar call? Notice, note this. One, it is to make it clear that after you have heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot be neutral. You must decide either to reject or to accept. I want you to accept. And it's to give to, it is to give the opportunity to those who want to get saved to be able to do that immediately, not to delay till tomorrow. It is also to identify, you see, it's for the evangelists and the counselors and the workers to be able to identify those who are receiving the Lord Jesus Christ who want to be saved so that they can offer further help to them and conserve the fruit of evangelism. And you know, when somebody comes forward, he will remember what he has done. In later years, it will be a means of assurance to him. He will remember, I came forward. I repented. I received the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart. And I even knew how the, how the minister said, if you want to receive Christ, if you want to be saved, come forward. And I came, and I know I'm saved. It's also a means of assurance in later years. How is it done? I told you it's done at the end of the message. And then, listen to me. It must be clear. It must be simple. It must be concise. You know, when some people, evangelists, when they preach the evangelistic message, and they want you to come forward, some of the people will say, you know, come forward, but they will not make it very clear why they are coming forward. But it must be very clear they are coming forward to repent. They are coming forward to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. They are coming forward to receive forgiveness from God. They are coming forward to identify they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if you say, well, uh, you have had a message and if you want um, God to give you money, you want God to heal you, you want God to save you, you want God to take you to heaven, you want God to make you happy all through your life, come forward. Everybody will come forward. That's not altar call. That's foolish. That's not biblical. That's not scriptural. You know, you don't give an altar call to make everybody, everybody come forward. You know, if you say, well, if, if you love God, if you love Jesus, if you are not uh, going to, if you are not a child of the devil, come forward. Now, if you say that everybody will come forward, but that's foolish. That's not clear. That's not simple. Make it very clear that they are coming forward because they want to repent. They want to turn away from their sins. They want eternal life. They want Jesus Christ to become their Lord and their Savior. If you tell them to come forward on that note, that's clear. That's simple. Don't prolong it. Make it very brief. Now, as they are coming forward, you give a brief explanation of why you have invited them forward. You explain to them you have done this so that they can show their faith. Because, you know, there is no secret disciple. And when you come forth publicly like that, you are saying, I am not ashamed of Christ. I'm not ashamed to publicly announce that I want forgiveness. I want eternal life. I want the Lord to be my Savior and my Lord. So you give a brief explanation of why they are coming forward. And then after that, you lead them in prayer to confess their sins to the Lord. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you encourage their faith and you tell them Jesus is at the door of your heart. It's knocking now. If you only open immediately, he'll enter into your heart. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to so forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, that's the whole reason why we we're inviting the people to come forward to receive Christ and we're making the appeal, we're giving the invitation, or if you like, we're giving the altar call. Now, let's see how it happened on the day of Pentecost. 
In a passage I've read to you, I'm looking at the people's reaction. The message has been given, what's the people's reaction? And what's the preacher's reply? And what are the positive results? People's reaction, preacher's reply, and the positive results. Now, the reaction. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Now, when they, had, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That means they were convicted because of their sins. They knew they had committed the greatest of sins. They had rejected Jesus Christ, the Messiah. They had sided in with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Pilate and Caiaphas, the high priest. They had sided in with the devil. They had been used as instruments of Satan to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of their cry, crucify him, crucify him. Christ the Lord, their own Messiah, approved of God by signs and wonders and miracles, had been crucified. And God had raised him from the dead, proving to them they were wrong. Proving to them that what they did was of Satan, of conviction. He may weep or he may not weep. He may shout or he may not shout. But when he comes in to that point of conviction that he says, what shall I do? He has heard the message. He wants to repent if he knows what it means. He wants to come to the Lord and he says, oh yes, I want forgiveness. I want to receive the mercy of God. I want the grace of God. I don't want God to judge me. What shall I do? When he comes to that conviction, he's ready for conversion. He's ready for the mercy of God. And I want to remind you again that this is the effect of the power of the Holy Ghost coming upon the apostles and disciples. So that as Peter preached in the power of the Holy Ghost, conviction came upon the hearers. That's exactly what Jesus Christ had promised at the coming of the Holy Ghost he will convict men of their sins. In John chapter 16, verses 7 to 11, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness, and of judgment. He, it's the Holy Ghost that reproves the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Now, it's not sad stories that convicts people of their sins. It is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, applied and preached in the power of the Holy Ghost. You can see that Peter here did not tell silly stories. False tales to make the people want to repent. You can see that Peter did not prolong the message and just preach and preach and preach and preach for hours to make them repent. You can see Peter did not do it. There was no gimmick. There was no pretense. It was not in the power of the flesh. It was in the demonstration of the power, the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. The word of God is the instrument in the hand of the Spirit of God that convicts sinners of their sins. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, For the word of God is quick, alive, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrows and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. 
And so Peter preached the word, explained Pentecost, exalted Christ, and exalted the people. And when he gave out the word, the people were convicted because he preached in the power of the Holy Ghost. And he asked the question, what shall we do? And I will see the preacher's reply. They have come to this point. And my brother, my sister, if you are a preacher, this is the climax for you. Because, you know, if you preach and there is no soul, that's like a cloud without rain, without water. That means you have made a lot of noise, but there is no result. And this is the moment you ought to be in prayer. You ought to be looking up to God. When the people come to the point, these are the labor and pains of the birth pangs of the preacher. That's the time you are linked up with heaven. You are linked up with God. And you are silently praying as you are giving the altar call that they will come. That, oh Lord, there will not be anybody there who Jesus died for that will reject this offer of salvation. You are silently praying like that. And outwardly you are giving out the altar call. You are saying, oh yes, God loves you. Jesus wants to come into your heart. If you'll just repent, he wants you to come even now. He's standing at the door of your heart. Don't delay till tomorrow. Come. He'll forgive you. No matter how many sins you have committed. No matter how long you have remained in sin. He will forgive you. As you are saying that you are silently, quietly praying. Oh Lord, bring them. Holy Ghost, bring them. Oh Father, help so that shame will not allow them to stand back in the congregation. You may even say... The counselors will be coming out of the congregation also because you know they, they'll be helping you or you may say if you if you find it difficult to come out but you really want to come out the spirit is moving upon you to want to come out you're under the conviction of the holy ghost to so come out you can tell the brother or the sister uh, standing by you to help you and to bring you out if you are ashamed or if you're afraid to come out alone you see, you are making it clear and you are clearing all the doubts in the hearts of the people so that they will yield to the Holy Ghost. You know, a person can be convicted of the Holy Ghost and he may not yield. He may not know how to do it. Or the people may be too large to him and he may be so embarrassed to come out. So uh, you are praying and linking up with heaven. And so it was important at this time. That Peter, the preacher, will reply in the proper way. When they said, what shall we do? What shall we do? And now Peter, the preacher, gave the reply. In the reply, we see three things. The precept, the privilege, and the promise. In verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent. That's a precept. That's a command. Repent. What does it mean to repent? It simply means to turn around. That's the meaning of the word, to change your mind. You have thought that Christ was a blasphemer. Now change your mind and accept his Christ and his Lord. You have thought that Christ was deceiving the people with the miracles and the signs and the wonders. Now change your mind and know that Christ is the very Son of God. That's what he meant when he said, repent. You have thought you were serving God when you crucified him. You have thought you were doing God a service when you got rid of Christ. Now change your mind and know that you were doing the devil, Satan, a service when you crucified the Lord. Change your mind. Repent. You, you had thought you were, you know, just worshipping God in your religion, in Judaism. When you rejected Christ, now change your mind. Turn around and recognize that... All the religion of the washing and the ceremonies and the going to the synagogue and coming to Jerusalem and praying and fasting, everything was in vain. Change your mind that the works of your hand cannot save you. Repent. And all the evil you have been doing, cheating, sinning, committing adultery and fornication, the evil you have been doing, turn around, change your mind, turn to the light and turn away from darkness. Repent Turn your mind, change your mind, turn around. That's what it means. That's the precept. And you know, he said in verse 40, in a practical way, uh, so that they will see what it actually means to repent. It means in verse 40, and with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. 
be separated from the multitude that are doing evil. Not the multitude at the retreat, but the multitude at home, the multitude in the street, the multitude everywhere. You've been following the multitude to do evil. Now change your mind and come and follow Christ. Repent. That's the uniform message of the Bible to sinners, to come to Christ, to turn around, to change their mind, to repent. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, repent ye therefore. You know, it's the same message. And be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And in chapter 17 of Acts, Acts 17 verse 30, And the times of this ignorance God winged out, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That's the precept. Now the privilege. Still verse 38, Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. The word that is uh, used there, which is for. For the remission of sin. Actually means because of the remission of sin. The Greek word is ace. E-I-S. Spelled with English uh, letters. And it means because of. It's saying if they repent, God is going to forgive them. It's already assuring them before they even repented. It's saying repent. And then yours will be the privilege of being baptized in water. Because of the remission, the forgiveness of sins. It was assuring them that God is a God of grace, a God of love, a God of mercy. And as they come forward, as they repent, God is going to forgive them. And is going to wipe away, blot out all their transgressions. And he's saying, and you will be baptized as a privilege for the remission, for the forgiveness of your sins. Now why do we call baptism here and in the Bible a privilege? Actually, you know, it's a public declaration, an act of their faith, that they were now breaking away from the devil, identifying with Christ. Because the Bible makes it clear that you are buried by water baptism. You are buried by baptism into his death, that you may be raised up out of that water into the newness of life. You are identifying with Christ in water baptism. And he's saying, break away from Satan. Come, a, come around and be identified with Christ. And as a public act of your identification with Christ, that you are now joined with Christ, you are baptized to announce to Israel that you, are, you have gone away from the camp of those who crucified Christ. He is now your Lord. He is now your Savior. You identify with him. Not only breaking away from Satan and identifying with Christ, it's breaking away from the world. The children of the devil, the children of darkness, breaking away from them and identifying with the body of Christ, with the family of God. So water baptism is an act of your faith as a result of your forgiveness and remission of sin, as a result of your salvation. So now announce to the public, you are now caught away, separated from the world. You are identified with Jesus Christ. Now it's saying you are, you are now breaking away from the system of this world. One, breaking away from Satan. Two, breaking away from the world. And three, breaking away from the systems, from the policies, from the ideas of the systems of the world. And now you are identifying with the principles of the kingdom of God. You are saying by your water baptism, I am no more going to live by the system of the world. I am going to live by the principles of the kingdom of God. A public identification. It's made known to the public what a great privilege to now be counted that you have severed your relationship with Judaism with old religion, with the world and Satan, you are now identified in a new union with the Messiah, with Christ, with the family of God. That's a great privilege. 
So he told them, the precept, repent. The privilege, be baptized in the name of Jesus. Which means, be identified with Christ in water baptism. And now, if you do that, much is awaiting you. This is a promise. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why was uh, the apostle bringing that in? When they had not even repented. I was telling them that, you know, you get, you repent, you turn away from your sins, and then you identify publicly with Christ Jesus and the body of Christ, and you're baptized in water. Then that's not the end of Christianity. You haven't got everything that Christianity offers. When you, are, when you have repented and you are forgiven, you have got forgiveness. You have got eternal life. You have got membership in God's family. You have got identification with Christ. You have got freedom, liberty, deliverance from the power of Satan. But much more, much more, much more is awaiting you as you now come into the kingdom. And one of the things awaiting you is the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 39, for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, the Gentiles, according to Ephesians chapter 2, those that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So now they had got the precept, repent. They have been told about the privilege they would have, they will be baptized in water. And they have been told about the promise. There is much more to receive after you have got saved. So continue with Christ and much more is to come. What's the result of all that? I you know this is the real thing you are looking for as you are preparing for this coming event for the retreat. You'll preach for a purpose. You'll sing for a purpose. You'll give the people come in free food for a purpose. You'll provide accommodation for them for a purpose. You'll counsel for a purpose. You'll teach in Bible study for a purpose. You'll do follow up for a purpose. What's the purpose? To have positive results. He had told them they must repent and save themselves from this untoward generation. Now we see their response to that. The result of that. In verse 41. Then they that gladly received this word were baptized. They gladly received his word. And the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Think about it. Only one day, one message were added unto them 3,000 souls. But uh, I must tell you something here. You see, many preachers are lazy. And many people who say they want to work for God, work for God, work for God. They think what it means to work for God is only to come up here and preach. For only one hour. My brother, my sister, it's not like that. It's much more, much more. Why do we say that? You realize, you know, they have been having a, a nice time. The sound of the rushing mighty wind had come into the room, filled all the house. And, uh, you know, they appeared unto them, cloven tongues like as of fire, and sat on each of them. They began to speak in tongues. When the Holy Ghost filled them, and now Peter preached, 3,000 became born again. Do you realize that that was much physical work for them? Because to baptize 3,000 people in water in one day, that's physical energy to be expended. Now, if you assume that it's the 12 apostles baptizing them in water, which is very, very likely. And when you think about only 12 people baptizing 300, 12 people baptizing 300, you know, uh, sorry, 3,000, you know, that means that each one is to baptize about 250. And to do that in one day, that's energy expended. And then to follow them up, that's real energy expended. It means that you are really giving yourself to the work of God. You are willing to give all the energy it will take. All the physical energy exertion it will take. That's working for God. Not only opening the Bible and preaching to people. And 3,000, they repented. 
They gave themselves to the Lord. Oh, they said, we're on the Lord's side. If you're on the Lord's side, can you come up here? They, they came forward and said, we're on the Lord's side. If you're turning away from your sin, you now know that Jesus Christ is not a blasphemer. Like the Jews said, like the Pharisees said, you now believe Jesus is the Lord, is the King of glory, is a prince, the perfect prince. Can you come and receive him as your Savior and Lord? And they came, they repented, they turned. And they submitted themselves to water baptism and they were added to the body of Christ and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers that's the final result continuing steadfastly wholeheartedly in the doctrine of the apostles they were now being taught you see after people have come to the Lord they must be they must be dedicated to studying the Bible every morning, quiet time, every night, quiet time, reading the Bible and praying. Coming for Monday Bible study, coming for Thursday Miracle Revival Hour, and coming for the Sunday worship. That's the sign and that's the result of true conversion. Receiving the word, giving themselves to it, and I'll continue to study that word. Continuing in fellowship with the body of Christ, with the 120 spirit filled people in the church. To continue in doctrine and fellowship is a true sign of conversion. Brothers and sisters, we're looking ahead to glorious days. And I'm believing God that as we, have, as we start the December retreat this Friday in 22 locations in Lagos State, and in 18 locations outside Lagos, it's all over the Federation of Nigeria. I am believing that the preachers are going to be full of the Holy Ghost. That those who preach are going to preach in the power of the Holy Ghost. Those who sing are going to sing in the power of the Holy Ghost. And those who counsel or teach Bible study or minister in any way, they are going to do it in the power of the Holy Ghost. And as the messages are given, as people are called for the altar call, and to make a decision, I am believing that in Lagos, in all the 22 locations, and all over Nigeria, thousands are going to come to the Lord. And I'm believing that as they come to the Lord, and as you do your part, and you put in all your strength, and all your time, and you pray for them, and you help them, and you follow them up, all these thousands, they are going to continue steadfastly and in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now tonight, I'm calling you to dedicate yourself to serve the Lord, to work for the Lord, so that whatever part you have at the retreat, it's going to make souls to come to the Lord in the name of Jesus. Now rise up and give yourself to the Lord. Your preaching will bring people to the Lord. Your singing will bring people to the Lord. Your counseling will bring people to the Lord. And your teaching the Bible as a Bible study leader will bring people to the Lord. Believe it, it will be so. Commit yourself to the Lord. It will empower you, anoint you, enable you to do the work he has committed into your hands. And if you are not yet saved, this is your chance. Repent, turn away from your sin, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior.